Hey everyone, and uh, welcome to Stochastic All the Things, uh, ray tracing and hybrid real-time rendering. Uh, my name is Tom, and I work in Stockholm in uh, Seed. Uh, Seed is a technical and creative research division of Electronic Arts. Uh, we are a cross-disciplinary team uh, with a mission to explore the future of interactive entertainment. Uh, one of our recent projects uh, is an experiment in hybrid real-time rendering, uh, deep learning, and procedural level generation. You might have seen this video, but we're going to play it anyway. Sorry for the choppy frame rate. My laptop is really convinced it's going to run out of power at some point. Uh, but you can check out the video on YouTube, and I promise it'll be smoother than that. Uh, Pika Pika is a, a mini game that we built for uh, AI agents uh, rather than humans. Uh, and through the use of reinforcement learning, uh, the agents learn to navigate and interact with a virtual environment. Uh, they run around fixing those uh, cute machines uh, that, so the conveyor belts can keep running. Uh, if you're interested in the artificial intelligence part, uh, do check out our paper and archive. Uh, it details how we train the agents, uh, what they see, and how they communicate with uh, the game logic. Well, we build the mini-game from the ground up in our uh, Halcyon R&D engine. It is a flexible experimentation framework uh, that is uh, still young, yet uh, capable of rendering shiny pixels. And thanks to a collaboration with NVIDIA and Microsoft, uh, we had the opportunity to work with an early version of uh, DirectX ray tracing and explore some of the possibility space of this technology. Uh, we had kind of guessed what uh, other uh, developers might create with it, and we uh, deliberately set out to create something a bit different. Uh, we wanted cute visuals that will be clean and stylized, uh, yet grounded in physically-based rendering. Uh, we aimed for something that would uh, show the strengths of ray tracing, uh, while also playing nice uh, with our uh, tiny art department. So we only had uh, two artists uh, at the start of the project, and uh, one joined a bit later. Uh, in order to create interesting variety, uh, we used uh, a procedural level generation algorithm with a, a compositional balance algorithm that drove layout and asset placement. And then to uh, retain sanity, we uh, forewent uh, baking, uh, proxy building, level of detail, and uh, generally any kind of uh, content hacks. But before we dive into the shiny pixels, uh, let's have a bit of a breather and uh, look at the map. Uh, while this talk is about uh, all things stochastic, it is uh, definitely mostly about uh, ray tracing. Uh, I'll discuss how the latter can be used to uh, render previously difficult phenomena such as uh, reflections, refractions, translucency, uh, indirect lighting, and shadows. But why would we even use ray tracing, right? Uh, well, if you're a graphics nerd, the question doesn't even need asking. Well, we want to use it because it's cool. It's been the, the holy grail of computer graphics for the past few decades. And uh, we might finally have the chance of uh, killing that uh, phrase, uh, ray tracing is the future and uh, ever will be. Uh, but let's put things into perspective. Uh, ray tracing isn't the very thing to be excited about. It's just shooting rays, right? But uh, it's uh, what we can do with it. So for example, one can write a path tracer in just a few hundred lines of code, and it will start producing photorealistic images like the one here. Uh, unfortunately, path tracing is not very fast. Uh, this image took around uh, 15 seconds to, to generate on a top end GPU. Uh, and there's still some tricky noise left in it, which might take hours to converge because of difficult light paths, uh, such as caustics. And then a one sample per pixel image looks uh, considerably noisy, uh, and even this is kind of expensive to render. But the good news is that uh, we can render this image at real-time frequencies uh, on today's hardware using hybrid rendering. It is not quite the same as the Pathtrix version. It is missing uh, costings and uh, some small-scale interreflections, but I would say it's pretty close. Uh, 
So let's compare it to a version without ray tracing. Yeah, it's uh, not very pretty, and uh, this is not uh, a hello world kind of render. It already includes uh, a number of non-trivial alg algorithms such as uh, screen space reflections, uh, state, art, state of the art, uh, screen space ambient occlusion, um, physically based rendering, temporal anti-aliasing, cascaded shadow maps, and so on. Even though some people uh, suggested that it might not be a fair comparison, uh, because in, if this was a, a game, then you would apply some classic game industry solutions. Uh, and for example, fix the, the light leaks and reflections with uh, local reflection probes, uh, then the floor is mostly flat, so maybe you could apply planar reflections to it. And then lighting uh, can be baked as well for the, for the GI and so on. On the other hand, this rendering pipeline is uh, uh, and why, uh, why ray tracing is so awesome. This rendering pipeline is, uh, is just a toggle. So you enable it and you get uh, good results by default. And it doesn't require any artist hacks and artist time. So what is this magic pipeline? Well, glad you asked. Uh, it's a hybrid of classic rendering techniques uh, with some ray tracing sprinkled, sprinkled on top of it. Uh, we have a pretty uh, standard uh, deferred shading pipeline with compute-based lighting, a pretty standard pulse processing stack, uh, and then we have a few pluggable components. Uh, we can render shadows via ray tracing or via cascaded shadow maps. Uh, reflections can be uh, ray traced or can be ray marched in the screen space. And then same story goes for ambient occlusion, also ray tracing or ray marching. Uh, only our global illumination and uh, translucency and transparency actually require ray tracing. And this, this rendering pipeline is built on top of a, a rather flexible material system. It mostly came to mind because of my dislike of the, the metalness trick, where you have a, a lerp factor between how dielectric and metal something is. Uh, but despite this uh, silly motivation, it's uh, allowed us to rapidly experiment with the looks for our demo and uh, easily match the output of ray tracing based renderers. Um, it doesn't explode during this experimentation either, uh, because you, you, and we enforce uh, energy conservation. And uh, we went between layers using uh, Fresnel equations, so it is all physically plausible. And then this material system works with uh, all our render modes, uh, be that's uh, the pure raster, the hybrid, or the ray tracing. And uh, this is where DXR shines. Uh, uh, you can reuse code across all those effects and shader stages. And this means, for example, that if you, can, if you validate your path tracer against a good known renderer, such as Mitsuba, you can then validate your other techniques against this reference and uh, make sure all of your rendering is consistent. So as soon as we actually had a, a good working path tracer, we started the journey into uh, hybrid rendering. And the first domain we explored was reflections. Uh, we should trace from the G buffer using the position and normal and, uh, and other information. We shoot them in at uh, uh, half resolution, uh, which means that for every four pixels, there is a single reflection ray. Uh, then usually when you have a hit point, uh, that point needs shadowing as well, meaning that we trace another ray, um, bringing it up to a total of uh, uh, two, sorry, a one half uh, ray per pixel. And it may not seem like much, but we can actually get quite a lot uh, from that if we apply uh, reconstruction and filtering. So we run a multi-stage algorithm which uh, denoises the reflections and brings them up to full resolution. And it works on arbitrary surfaces with uh, spatially varying normals, roughness, and the different material types. The reflection system comes with its own pipeline. Uh, we start by generating arrays via important sampling. And this gives us uh, rays that follow the properties of our materials. Uh, then scene intersection can be done via either uh, screen space reflection or ray marching, uh, well, or ray tracing. Uh, and in the case of the former, uh, SSR can report failure, for example, when the ray tries to go behind an object. And then that can be picked up, uh, picked up by an environment map uh, gap fill solution. And what's interesting is those intersectors can be chained after one another. So when SSR reports failure, then ray tracing can actually pick up where SSR last left off and continue the ray. Now, once intersections have been found, we proceed to reconstruct the reflected image. Our spatial kernel uh, reuses ray hit information across pixels, uh, upsampling the image to full resolution. It also calculates uh, useful information for uh, a temporal accumulation pass. And finally, we run a last chance uh, noise cleanup algorithm in the form of a pretty simple cross bilateral. Cross -bilateral. And then the uh, SSR bits are not very interesting for the presentation. Uh, they have been talked about uh, for years. Uh, so we're only focused on ray tracing. Uh, 
So the first pass, the reflection sampling, is a pretty simple one. Uh, given an eye direction, uh, we need to generate a reflected ray matching the BRDF. Uh, sampling from the complete BRDF function is rather involved, uh, so we only import the sample from the normal distribution. So we pick a microfacet normal, reflect the eye vector off of it, and we get a ray direction. But since we only have a quarter array per pixel, uh, we must ensure that uh, we get a uh, high quality distribution of those reflection vectors. And the, the very minimum we can do is uh, use a low discrepancy uh, quasi random sequence. And uh, Halton is usually a safe bet. Uh, we then couple it with a per pixel jitter of those uh, generated samples uh, known as uh, Cranley pattern zone rotations. And then from every point in this uh, 2D primary sample space, uh, we generate a reflected direction. Because we're sampling from the normal distribution alone and not the full BRDF, we actually may end up with uh, vectors which are implausible and go below the horizon. There are fancy ways of dealing with this problem, such as uh, sampling from the visible microfacets that uh, Eric Heiss detailed, but we didn't have quite uh, enough time to investigate it for our demo, so we simply detect this case and uh, just re-roll the ray. The reflection pass works with our layer materials and uh, still generates just one direction for the whole stack. Uh, the simplest way to accomplish this would be to, to choose one layer in the stack by random, for example, with uniform weights, and then sample from that specific uh, layer. Uh, this works, but can be quite wasteful. Uh, for example, a smooth uh, dielectric uh, clear coat layer will be almost imperceptible heads on, but when and you look at the, at the grazing angles, because of Fresnel, it dominates the, the full reflection, which means that if we uniformly distribute the, the layers between stacks, we will be wasting rays in some cases. So to improve on this scheme, we draw the layer itself from a probability mass function based on the layer's approximate visibility. Uh, it is also important to keep in mind that uh, multiple layers could potentially generate the same direction. It is pretty significant because we later use those rays and their probabilities uh, in the spatial reconstruction pass. And then to make the, this pass oblivious or of which uh, layer the, the ray came from, uh, we have to add up the probabilities uh, so that the ray looks like it came from the whole stack and not from the individual layer. And since we reuse rays across uh, a number of different techniques, such as the SSR, the, the, the gap fill, and ray tracing, uh, our ray generation pass is separate from the DXR region stage, uh, which makes, it makes the region a, a trivial shader. It just uh, reads the previously generated ray direction, calls uh, trace ray on it, and that's basically the same as a path tracing function and then outputs the results into uh, to RGBA 16F textures. And besides color, we output some information for the reconstruction, such as the ray direction, the, the inverse probability of having sampled the ray, and the, the hit point, the hit direction, sorry, hit time. Uh, and after all this work, we get something like this. Uh, it more or less resembles the reflection component of the path trace image uh, from a few slides back, uh, except this one is half resolution and uh, doesn't do rec the recursive bouncing. So you may be asking yourself, like, why go through all this trouble just to generate a noisy image? And why don't we just start with uh, mirror-like reflections and blur them as a post-process? And it is a valid question, and I think the, the right answer is somewhere in the middle. So stochastic sampling is uh, prone to cache thrashing. Cache thrashing produces uh, all sorts of noise. Uh, on the other hand, a post-processing filter uh, may introduce light bleeding, uh, because the whole gather area will, will potentially bleed across walls. Uh, and then it can uh, still produce uh, noisy outputs uh, if you have high-frequency information in the scene, such as uh, high-frequency normal maps. Uh, besides that, the non-stochastic approaches uh, can suffer a bit more from uh, structured, al structured aliasing, like fences and uh, staircases and so on. And that kind of aliasing is uh, usually more difficult to filter out than, than plain noise. So in, in practice, the, those non-stochastic approaches could well produce more objectionable artifacts than stochastic ones. Uh, that being said, those uh, noisy or stochastic approaches uh, have a tendency to amplify variants present in the scene. Uh, so for example, a horror case is a tiny emissive uh, uh, lights, uh, because the chance of hitting them is very low, but when you do hit them, the, suddenly the intensity is super high. So perhaps there's a solution somewhere in the middle where you can kind of change how stochastic the approach is by the, kind of just lurping between stochastic and non-stochastic, or maybe you can uh, use uh, pre-filtering. And, and some research is still required in, in this area. Uh, 
Uh, but our reflection pipeline is already a step in that direction, more or less, uh, combining stochastic sampling with uh, spatial reconstruction. And in practice, we actually bias our uh, primary sample space to make the rays uh, travel more towards the perfect mirror direction. And then we cancel some of this bias in the uh, spatial reconstruction. So once again, this is the, the raw ray trace output. And this is what the uh, spatial filter does with it. Uh, the output is still noisy, but it's now full resolution. And uh, it gives us uh, variance reduction similar to actually having shot around 16 rays uh, per pixel. And the idea behind it is uh, very similar to the stochastic screen space reflections, which I presented three years ago at SIGGRAPH. So I will not go into too many details, uh, but as a quick recap, uh, Every full resolution pixel uses a set of those uh, ray hits that were intersected by the, the pipeline and it reconstructs the, the, resolution, the, the reflection. And it's uh, basically a, a fancy uh, weighted sum where the, the local pixel's BRDF is used to, to scale the intensity and the, the ray's own PDF is used to, to, to reduce it. Uh, and Recently, uh, Eric Heitz, Stephen Hill, uh, Morgan McGuire, and uh, Ari Silvanoinen pointed out that it is something called a ratio estimator, so apparently the math is pretty sound. Uh, a few shortcuts here and there mean that uh, it cannot be uh, unbiased or even consistent, but it works pretty well in practice. And uh, in practice, the code is super simple as well. Uh, as I mentioned, it's just a fancy weighted sum. What is a bit uh, more interesting is the, the set of uh, rays that each pixel uses in the reconstruction. So suppose we took the same set of rays across uh, all the pixels, uh, and because our uh, hit buffers are half resolution, we will be using the same data for every uh, pixel in a 2x2 two two, uh, tile, and thus we get uh, half resolution results. We can fix that pretty easily by uh, using disjoint ray sets uh, between those uh, four pixels in a 2x2 two two block. So we need four sample sets, uh, which are four pixels we use in the quad, and those samples should be well distributed between each other, and uh, ideally should be as disjoint as possible. So I don't know about you, but uh, this screams blue noise to me. And uh, here is this one weird trick. Uh, so we start with uh, uniform blue noise, and we threshold it into four classes, like this. And then the class determines uh, which pixel the, the, the sample position goes to. So we just uh, pick a center somewhere in, in the middle of this blue noise and uh, treat the coordinates of the, of the respective pixels as offset to sample into the, the ray buffers, and, uh, and this is our distribution. We can even sort the positions by distance to the center and uh, use those in adaptive kernels where you uh, vary the number of, of rays your samples use to, to get uh, more filtering, but uh, potentially more bleeding as well. So this is the, more or less the idea behind the spatial reconstruction filter, uh, which is then followed by temporal accumulation to further clean up the image. And finally, by a much simpler uh, bilateral filter uh, that removes some of the remaining noise. Uh, it is a very blunt instrument, uh, which overblurs the image, uh, but we needed it to, to handle some of the rougher reflections. So compared to screen space reflections, uh, ray tracing is trickier because we uh, can't cheat and use a blurred uh, version of the frame buffer to get a pre-filtered uh, radiance value. So because there's much more noise, our filters need to be much, much more aggressive as well. But uh, we can still tell this filter to cool it uh, unless the image is actually noisy, or um, locally noisy. So we estimate variance in the image uh, in the spatial reconstruction pass and use it to, to drive or steer the, the, the bilateral kernel. So the variance then uh, controls how many samples and how wide the kernel becomes, preventing overblurring. Finally, we throw all of this at uh, temporal anti-aliasing and get a pretty clear image at the end. So it is important that this all comes from uh, a quarter array per pixel per frame, and it works with uh, dynamic objects and uh, camera movement as well. And movement is particularly difficult uh, for temporal techniques, as they need to perform reprojection to correlate images between frames. And this isn't always trivial. We actually have two very different methods of uh, reprojecting reflections. 
So we can use the motion vector of the reflector, uh, which we have basically for free because a whole other, lot of other techniques use it, such as motion blur and TAA. And that one is the line uh, below. The, and then we can use, uh, we, then reflections have their own parallax. Uh, they kind of move uh, independently of the surface which reflects them. Uh, we can track the, that by uh, calculating the average uh, distance to the hit points and uh, reprojecting the average to, uh, hit between the two frames. And this is the line uh, on the top. As you can see, they're quite different. So uh, we have two very different strategies, but uh, who says we have to restrict ourselves to just one? Uh, but if you consider a few cases, uh, they, none of those techniques clearly dominates as well. So uh, per, per pixel motion vector works pretty well for rough and curved surfaces. Uh, for example, the robot's head. Uh, but it fails a lot with uh, shiny surfaces. So check it out on the left. So the robots are kind of pretty cool, but the, the ground is, is horrible. And then hit point reprojection works uh, pretty well for the floor, but fails spectacularly on the, on the robot's head. Yeah, as I mentioned, uh, who says we have to use just one method? Why not both? Uh, why not uh, reproject using both of those techniques and then blend between them uh, depending on how well they fit to the new frame? Uh, we can build uh, pretty simple statistics of the, from the newly uh, generated frame and uh, use them to score the, the two reprojection methods. For example, if we calculate uh, uh, the mean color and standard deviation uh, for every new pixel, we can define a distance metric and use it to weigh the reprojected values. So check out the result and pay attention to the, the floor and the little robots. So this is certainly not there yet, uh, but it works better than using uh, one of those schemes alone. And this, this is just some uh, arbitrary math just kind of tapped out on the keyboards. Uh, but what is left is mostly just uh, the seclusion. And as Brian Carr's, uh, Hugh Mullen, and uh, Tim Lotz pointed out in the uh, temporal anti-aliasing saga, uh, we can use basically the same local pixel statistics to build a bounding box of plausible values on the new frame and use them to either, re either reject or clamp the, the values reprojected to force them to fit to the new distribution. Uh, we can still use the dual source reprojection, but we now weigh, the, uh, weigh and accumulate the clamp uh, contributions. Now, this clamping is not a free lunch, and uh, it biases the result and can cause some flickering, but it definitely cleans up the ghosting pretty nicely. Now, thanks to ray tracing, uh, we can scatter lighting not just in empty spaces, but uh, inside volumes as well, and this enables uh, realistic refractions and translucency. Uh, in our Halcyon framework, we have implemented those as separate yet closely related effects. Uh, for refractions, we support multiple inter interface transi transitions, uh, rough surfaces and light absorption as it travels in the medium. Uh, the technique is order independent and meshes seamlessly with other rendering phenomena. Our translucency is a simple yet effective method inspired by Colambert Brisbois' work in Frostbite a few years ago. Uh, the most important difference is that we skip pre-computation and dynamically scatter light inside the medium. Both translucency and rough refractions require multiple samples in order to converge to a noise-free result. Uh, those are also difficult to filter because of the possibility of multiple layers overlapping. Uh, currently, the best, uh, uh, most successful denoisers uh, assume just one layer of surfaces, uh, which makes the, the screen space filtering intractable. Perhaps some solutions exist around the uh, deep frame buffers, per pixel link lists, and the uh, full 3D denoising, but we didn't have quite the time to investigate those for our demo. So we cut corners and uh, use texture space integration. And while this goes against our goal of not requiring parameterizations, uh, translucency and refractions were used uh, quite sparsely, and we could afford to unwrap a few objects. And static space allocation uh, in textures provides uh, a stable integration domain, which we can time slice over um, a budget of, uh, say, a million rays per frame. And here's a breakdown of how we compute translucency. We first dynamically render uh, textures with normal and position information for all the users of translucency. Uh, we generate array from every such valid position uh, and using, use the surface normal for direction. Uh, we then flip the, the array and push it inside the object. From that location, we generate translucency arrays, which will travel inside the medium. Uh, we calculate lighting at that location, and we gather all the samples from it. Finally, we update the value stored in the texture. Uh, 
And this is an extremely crude approximation, and any volumetric people in the crowd are probably cringing, as this should require things like phase functions and uh, multiple scattering, but uh, even this crude hack pr produces pretty good-looking results for us. And we let the results converge uh, over multiple frames via temporal accumulation. Uh, spatial filtering can be used as well, but we didn't hit enough noise to actually warrant uh, make it worthwhile. And since lighting conditions uh, can change with objects moving, a temporal filter needs to be able to adapt to them. Uh, depending on your use case, a simple exponential moving average may do the trick. Uh, we use a slightly fancier adaptive uh, temporal filter based on exponential averaging. Uh, it varies its uh, hysteresis, or the, the blending rate, uh, to quickly reconverge um, to dynamic change in conditions. And I'm going to cover it a bit uh, later in the section of, glo of global illumination. A similar approach uh, as for translucency is used for uh, refra refractions, uh, such as glass. Uh, the major difference is that uh, we warp the rays against uh, the, the view's origin. Uh, for clear glass, the refraction can be based on good old Snell's law, but for round glass, a scattering function must be used, uh, which generates rays refracted of microfacets uh, to widen the, the cone of refraction for uh, rougher interfaces. Uh, we trace array in a scene, the uh, sample lighting, and uh, finish by modulating the results uh, by uh, the medium's absorption according to Beer's law. And uh, chromatic aberration can also be used. And uh, neatly, DXR uh, provides us information about uh, which side of the face we're hitting. Uh, so we can track the current index of refraction knowing whether we're inside the medium or outside and correctly handle the transitions with uh, total internal reflection. The uh, interaction of refractive surfaces with light is definitely not completely solved now. Uh, for shadow rays, we assume uh, that objects are uh, fully opaque, and this uh, uh, causes some energy loss. And to handle shadows for this uh, innocent-looking pen, uh, we would actually need caustics, because the, the shadow rays are actually bent. And uh, that is for another time, because caustics are some of the most difficult problems to, to handle in rendering. So we've now covered uh, indirect specular and transmission. Uh, so let's talk about the, the rest of light transport now. I mean, indirect lighting applied in a diffuse manner to scene surfaces. Uh, GI makes scene elements fit with, with each other and makes the life of artists easier, as it reduces the need to manually place fill lines and tweak surface colors. We set out to create a solution that was uh, dynamic without uh, the need for any pre-computation or even UVs. It had to support dynamic and static scenes, and uh, we wanted it to uh, converge to a high-quality result, or refine to high-quality results, uh, in, at least in static regions. Uh, to motivate the importance of proper GI, have a look at uh, one of our, our early test renders without it, and now compared to one with indirect diffuse lighting. Uh, I think the difference is striking, and motivated us to actually go from a prototype to the final implementation. It was obvious from the start, though, that we didn't have the GPU budget to fully solve GI every frame. Uh, some sort of spatial or temporal accumulation would be needed. Um, with a path tracing integrator and or all our other rendering um, already there, we could only afford around a quarter, quarter million rays per uh, frame uh, to generate GI. The most important decision to make uh, was to whether accumulate in screen space or in world space. Uh, there have been a few techniques that success successfully perform uh, spatial-temporal integration in screen space uh, by using uh, fancy uh, filters. And uh, they kind of work on the, the nice idea, nice uh, uh, side effect of those is that if you move the camera close to a corner, you actually get uh, increasing resolution. You move further away and you, you still retain the same uh, distribution of samples across the scene. Uh, but those techniques typically showcase only static environments, and we are really afraid that uh, ghosting will be ruining our day with our moving agents. So we actually went with, uh, went with uh, uh, world space storage for our GI accumulation in a form of uh, dynamically distributed circles. So each of those uh, will be represented, represented with a position and normal uh, radius and some additional information. Having them persistent meant that we could uh, reliably accumulate over time and never worry about the seclusions. A uh, free-form cloud of surface uh, also means that no parameterization of the scene uh, is necessary. And then by giving them a smooth fall-off during rendering, we also obtain smooth results. The surfaces can also be skinned in order to support animated objects, so they remember which object they respond on, uh, and they uh, move with it every frame. Uh, and this does pose a challenge uh, for temporal accumulation, but it is not as severe as ghosting from screen space techniques. 
the appliance circles to the screen, uh, we render them in a similar way to light sources. We use smooth step for distance attenuation uh, with the Mahalanobis metric to, to squish them in the normal direction. Uh, we also have angular fall off, uh, but each surface payload itself is uh, just irradiance when you, with, without any directionality. And similarly to deferred lights, uh, we have a cooling system, a culling system, sorry. In order to be able to, to query the GI solution anywhere, we use a world space uh, data structure. For simplicity, it is a grid uh, in which every cell stores a list of intersecting circles. Uh, each pixel or point in space can then query the structure and find all the relevant circles. Uh, the GI has limited resolution and lacks high frequency detail, so we augment it with uh, screen space based ambient occlusion implement, implemented after uh, Grand Truth AO uh, from Jorge and colleagues. And uh, we use it, the colored multi bounce variant of it, as it uh, helps to keep the, uh, the warmth in our tour like scenes. As I mentioned, uh, circles are, sp are spawned on the fly and require no pre-computation. Here's a clip of the process in action at around 1% uh, speed. Uh, as you can see, the distribution is quite even and resembles the, the Poisson disk distribution. You get no clumping of the surface in some areas, and it's, uh, it's pretty pleasing to the eye to look at it. The placement algorithm uses uh, G-buffer information, and it is an iterative hole filler. Uh, we start by calculating the coverage of each pixel by the current circle set. We are interested in pixels with uh, low coverage, so you, since we would like to spawn new uh, circles in those locations. So in order to find best candidates, we need to find the worst coverage across the screen. Uh, we do, that, do it by dividing the screen in tiles, and then for each tile we find the, the lowest uh, uh, coverage using some uh, thread group atomics and uh, wave operations. Now, having found the, the point, the, the pixel, we can spawn a new circle at this location using gbuffer uh, normal in depth to reconstruct the word space data. And now, it is important to spawn the circles uh, probabilistically. So suppose you have a camera which goes very close to a wall, and then uh, it's an area which doesn't have circles yet, and suddenly all the pixels are shouting that they need new circles, and then all tiles will also spawn, want to spawn in the, in the same locations. But because we're very close to, to one location, you end up with tons of circles in, in, in the same space. Uh, so the probabilistic spawning works by uh, changing the probability uh, of spawning based on the projected area of the pixel. Uh, which means that uh, we draw a number every frame uh, in every tile and then uh, decide uh, whether to actually use the, the pixel or not, whether to reject it. And uh, we continue this process uh, all the time, uh, basically every frame, uh, and, and whenever there's poor coverage, we just spawn a new, new circle in it. Now that we know everything about spawning circles and applying to the screen, let's uh, talk about uh, how their irradiance is calculated. Uh, that part is actually super simple. Uh, we start by building a uh, basic unidirectional path tracer with uh, explicit light connections. Uh, we allocate more paths to the newly spawned circles, so we don't initially look at noise. But we then uh, decrease the, the number of paths uh, to roughly uh, one per, uh, per circle per frame. Full recursive part tracing, however, is a bit expensive, and uh, for our use case, it is also unnecessary. We can exploit temporal coherence by reusing previous outputs and amortizing the extra bounces over time. So in practice, we limit the path length to just one edge, uh, meaning that we shoot array and then immediately look up the, the previous frame's GI data. It, is, it makes the algorithm much closer to radiosity than, than path tracing, uh, but the visual results are quite similar. And path tracing typically uses uh, Monte Carlo integration to actually calculate values from this averaging. If expressed as a running uh, mean estimator, it's, uh, it's an average of contributions with uh, linearly decaying weights. Uh, its convergence hinges on the integrand being immutable, though. And in our case the, of the dynamic GI, the integrand changes all the time. So interactive path tracers and progressive light map bakers uh, typically tackle this by resetting accumulation on change so you get rid of the accumulated error. Their goals are different, though, and uh, they try to converge to the correct solution uh, and don't want the, any error. So uh, in the, our case, uh, our needs are a bit different, and we don't want the, the, the sharp cutoff. And since we cannot use proper Monte Carlo, uh, we basically just outright give up on uh, ever fully converging. <clears throat> Instead, we use a modified exponential means estimator uh, whose formulation is very similar to that of uh, plain Monte Carlo. 
However, the difference is that the blending factor is uh, in, in how the blending factor is defined. So in uh, exponential averaging, the weight for a new sample is uh, constant and typically set to a small value. Uh, so that the input uh, variance will not be jarring in the output if you, if you just scale it down by a, a tiny number. It is easy to notice, however, that uh, if the input doesn't have high variance, then the output will not either, so we're kind of potentially wasting convergence speed. And uh, we can potentially use a higher blending factor when we detect that variance is, uh, is low. Uh, however, the specifics of our integrands uh, change dynamically uh, all the time, and we need to figure that out from the scene. Uh, so to figure it out, we use uh, uh, short-term st statistics of, uh, of mean and variance to inform the long-term blending factors. <clears throat> and uh, they give us the, the idea of the plausible range of values uh, that the samples should fall into. When you generate new ones, you can, can, they should fall within like two sigma, for example. And when they start to drift, we can uh, increase the blending factor as well. <clears throat> and this is illustrated here uh, with the adaptive uh, integrator uh, marked in red. The blue line is just a, a regular exponential blending. And it clearly has a hard time following what's going on. Uh, meanwhile, the short-term statistics marked in gray inform our adaptive estimator of probable changes in the scene, uh, making it adapt faster, yet uh, converge with similar precision to the exponential averaging as well. And so while ray tracing helps with global illumination, it is certainly not a game changer for it. Uh, where ray tracing does improve the state of the art dramatically is uh, shadow rendering. Hard shadows become trivial. You just uh, uh, launch the ray, check if uh, anything blocks it, and just write out the result. Uh, and soft shadows are pretty easy, too. So you launch the rays in a, in a cone, and you get uh, variable penumbra, quantum hardening. Uh, at least it's uh, easy to get a noisy result. Uh, but uh, we can still filter it pretty efficiently without shooting any new rays. We implemented a denoiser based on NVIDIA's uh, spatiotemporal variance guided filtering paper. And for those unfamiliar with the algorithm, it is uh, basically temporal accumulation uh, coupled with a multipass blur. And the, the blur's footprint is varied uh, depending on the local variance. A spatiotemporal estimate of that variance uh, runs before and, and during the blurring to, to control it. And an important aspect to note is that uh, it is a general denoiser, which doesn't actually have any domain-specific knowledge of, uh, of shadow casting, yet it still produces uh, very realistic shadows. And let's zoom in on some of the details. Uh, uh, we can see that uh, we get sharp contact hardening uh, and also get rid of the, the noise in the soft penumbra regions, and we don't overblur when it's not necessary. We only modified SVGF a bit uh, in order to tailor it to our use case. And most importantly, we wanted to, to be more reactive in dynamic conditions. So we coupled it with a, a color bounding box clipping similar to the one in uh, temporal anti-aliasing. Uh, the only difference really is that uh, we're dealing with uh, scalar values, so it's uh, a bit cheaper to calculate. And we use Marco Savi's uh, formulation of the bounding box calculation using a 5x5 five five, uh, spatial uh, filter to figure out the standard deviation. And while the result is not perfect and it still exhibits some noise, uh, it is uh, hardly perceptible once we actually combine it with the rest of the shading. To wrap things up, uh, ray tracing makes it possible to replace uh, refined hacks uh, with uh, unified approaches, uh, making it possible to finally phase out uh, artifact-prone algorithms uh, such as uh, screen space reflections, along with uh, all the artist's time uh, that are, is required to tune them. It is not a free lunch, though, as uh, considerable effort needs to go into uh, re reconstruction and filtering. There is still a lot of research to be done. It is also just another tool in the box, and uh, it should be used wisely where it makes the most sense. Before hardware catches up with demand, we need to be uh, quite conservative in how we use our ray budgets. Uh, at the same and we're only beginning to, uh, to scratch the surface of what is possible with the technology. Uh, even then, I think it's very encouraging that we can uh, begin to approach the quality of uh, path trace uh, images with just, uh, over, with just over two and a half, just over two rays per pixel. And finally, I would like to thank all those people who contributed to the uh, Pika Pika project. It was an uh, awesome and dedicated effort on uh, the, the side of our team, but we also could not have done it without uh, our external partners. And on one last note, I would like to point out that we're hiring for multiple positions at Seed. Uh, so if you're interested, please uh, give me a shout. <laughs>
and this might leave us a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Now, Thank you. time for questions. We invite here in front of the hall. <laughs> Hello. Hey, uh, thank you so much for the talk. Um, you mentioned for the, uh, the reflection uh, bilateral filter that you had a local estimate for the variance. Mm -hmm. um, would it make sense at all to use that for um, picking uh, new ray directions or similar, like to focus uh, rays where there was much variance either last frame or to refine the result? Yeah, I was actually considering of doing exactly that. So, um, it, the variance estimate it needs to be pretty stable, though. Uh, we do apply temporal filtering to it, so it's, maybe it could work. Currently, we just have a, a constant bias of something like uh, cutting the 30% 30, 30 of, the, of the primary sample space, but uh, it might be a good idea to, to use uh, the, the variance estimate as well. Yeah. Cheers. Anyone else? That's a great chance. I'll not buy Don't waste it. I'll only send uh, our robots after you. All right. Thank you very much. Don't forget to rate the lecture uh, in our app. It's very important feedback for us and for people who, who present here. Um, at 1 p.m. we have lunch. We have a premi premiere of um, a movie, uh, We Are All Right. And if you want to join us for the next lecture here, please stay. Thank you.